altitude, like the high desert, they're very common. And they cleaned off the rover. Now, I have been in the space business for over 45 years, and there is something that many of you have probably heard of called Murphy's Law. If anything can go wrong, it will. This is the only time <laughs> nature ever helped me. Uh, because, indeed, the reason that these rovers have lasted so long is because of good engineering, sure, uh, but the dust devils cleaning off the solar panels. But what uh, nature giveth, nature can taketh away. And in June of last year, there occurred a weeks-long, several months-long dust storm. These aren't very common, but they're known, and they occur on Mars every few years, a global dust storm. So this is, if you were uh, looking up from the uh, Opportunity rover toward the sky, you would see the sun on the left through a dark sky, and as the dust storm got worse and worse and worse and worse, that's what you would see, essentially nothing. No sunlight coming down and dust everywhere. That's the point where we lost contact with Opportunity. And it's been out of contact since June. Most of the thinking is that this global dust storm covered the solar panels with so much dust that it can't get enough power to recharge the batteries. But NASA is still listening, They'll continue to listen uh, until the end of this month, and then they'll decide if they're going to continue or not. But I would say 14 years versus three months, all you taxpayers got your money's worth. Now, back up to orbit for a minute. This is the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. It is our spy satellite around Mars. It's capable of a resolution down to size about this big or so. And this is an example of the kind of pictures it has taken. It's taken images of all of the rovers that are uh, currently on Mars, including some from years ago. And the very high resolution of this orbiter allows us to tell what is caused by wind, versus what's caused by water. And this mission has given us some extraordinary new findings. And let me just point out a few of those. One is, uh, a little over a year ago, the finding of a gigantic glacier the size of New Mexico. If you melted all the water in this glacier, it would fill Lake Superior. Now, this was done through what's called ground penetrating radar. So this radar goes from orbit down into the ground of Mars and bounces back, and by interpreting that data that comes back, you can tell what it interacted with. So here's this gigantic glacier underneath the surface, slightly underneath the surface of Mars, the massive amount of water ice. And this is again showing how follow the water has paid off by looking for those, that evidence of water in all its various forms we continue to follow the trail that we think will lead us to the footprints, the fingerprints of life. Um, just a year ago, when I was on uh, this cruise, in this very room a year ago, I announced something that had just been published the day before, which was seeing ice cliffs 300 feet tall. So the, this orbiter took a picture from the side, saw that cliff on the left, put it through some processing, and discovered that there is about six inches of dust. Then the soil, remember I showed you that picture of uh, blue at the poles, up to 80% water ice? Then that's been confirmed again. Uh, Ice-rich soil, three to six feet. And then massive ice, up to 300 feet deep. That's the, uh, the schematic on the right in the picture in the center, in the center of, the, uh, of the chart there. Again, showing this enormous reservoir of water that was there on Mars and is now frozen. But what about liquid water? This just came out in July. So six months ago, uh, a European mission called Mars Express, which has a different kind of radar, uh, made by the same science group, but two different frequencies. It's two different kinds of penetration. They published results showing a liquid water lake about 12 miles across, 20 kilometers wide, about maybe a mile or so under the surface. So this 
is now a major breakthrough. We've been waiting and waiting and waiting. Can we see evidence of liquid water on Mars? And we've finally seen it. So it takes a few years from when I first said follow the water uh, in uh, the year 2001 until now. But this sequence of missions <clears throat> that are international uh, have found that first bit of evidence. I expect this group is going to be publishing more and more uh, data that looks like this. Now, that's terrific news from orbit, but what about the ground truth again? What about really confirming that that stuff that you see near the surface is, in fact, uh, water ice? So a mission was sent called Phoenix about 10 years ago. It landed near the North Pole of Mars, which if you remember that picture, it showed up to 80% water ice. Well, they found it. They dug up the soil, and you see these little rocks down in the left-hand corner here. They're up in that expanded picture up there, and those little pieces of ice were taken into the onboard laboratory and confirmed to be water ice. So, indeed, the things that we've seen from orbit about all of that water and the form of ice are indeed true. So the next mission, the last one in the queue that I personally put into place, is the Mars Science Laboratory. Now, here's the family tree here, uh, the growth of rovers. The little bitty one there is the Mars Pathfinder, weighed about 40 pounds or so. The middle one, Spirit and Opportunity. We just saw how they got to the surface and why they've lasted so long. Those are about 300 pounds or so, sort of a small golf cart size. The one on the far left is Curiosity. The Mars Science Laboratory rover weighs a metric ton. So uh, about 1,800 pounds, equipped with the most sophisticated laboratory that we've ever sent to another world. Uh, how do you get a 1,800-pound rover, which is you know, sort of John Deere truck size, to the surface of Mars? Turns out that the airbag technique won't work. You can't scale it up big enough. So instead, what uh, the engineering staff presented to me uh, and what we looked at was something that you'll see in just a second. This is where it's going, or where it went, Gale Crater. Um, and the reason that Gale Crater was picked is because it's like a time machine. So this crater was gouged out two billion years ago by some huge impact and then filled in over time. And over time, the uh, uh, material that filled in would give you from the earliest as you drove up the mountain to the latest material, and that would tell us about the history of Mars. So that's why Gale Crater was picked. So how do you get there? Well, you use something called the sky crane. Same supersonic parachute, but this time guided entry so that you can be very accurate. And then, just above the surface, you drop off the rocket-powered helicopter. And so you have a mothership that's carrying the rover down to the surface. As you get just above the surface, maybe 30, 40 feet, you lower the rover down to about one meter per second, about like that, gently to the surface, cut the cables, the mothership flies away, and then you have this extremely sophisticated rover sitting on the surface of Mars. It comes equipped with a, a truly amazing set of instrumentation. I'll just let this run for a minute so you can see one of the first ones. This is a way of examining rocks to determine which ones you want to take a sample of. Um, this has a very uh, elaborate name. It's got a very uh, sophisticated camera on the surface that looks around, examines everything in the field of view, looks for interesting rocks, then goes and drives over to it. The thing in the back is a radioisotope power supply. Uh, we knew that long-term, having 
solar panels would not be a good idea because of the dust. So in this rover, which was built a number of years later, we were able to incorporate this uh, radioactive power supply that means it's got very long life, 15 years or so maybe. So once a rock of interest is identified and pictures are taken of it, then we use what's called the zapper. This is all done through software instructions that are sent up to the robot, then it does it uh, autonomously. So what you can do by hitting this with a laser and evaporating the surface of it is you can get an, a spectra. You can get information about what are the elements in that rock, and that will tell you whether that rock is worth following up with more measurements or not. So this is where, as I said, Curiosity is going. It's something that's been labeled Mount Sharp. And uh, the mountain is the result of two billion years worth of material built up, and so it acts like a time machine as you drive from where you landed, which is the oldest part up the side of the mountain, you get to younger and younger surfaces. So what has been found, um, first of all, the first, almost the first drill hole showed that there was a, a past habitable environment. Didn't say that it found life, but they said if life were there, it would be able to survive. And they found very simple organics. Now this is sort of like cleaning fluid here, chlorobenzene. Don't worry about the, the uh, biochemistry name, just that it's a simple organic, because we're going to come back to that in a second. And then the weather and analysis, uh, environmental analysis shows that there has been a water cycle. A water cycle, very briny water, very salty water, but indications of water going on in recent times uh, from being evaporated, coming back down, maybe as a snow or frost, then being evaporated again. We've also found methane. Um, now, uh, this is what the burps look like. Uh, on Earth, methane, as many of you know who have been on farms, you get a lot of methane from cows, yes. I'm not saying there's Martian cows. Hey, don't run off to the National Enquirer. <laughs> Mars R says Mars cows. No. Um, there are two ways to make methane. One, on the right, is using the heat from the underground, from what's left over from the uh, molten core of Mars, heating water, and that water going through some chemistry and coming out is methane. But there is also a way of making methane with biology. And the fact that this rover has sniffed this periodically, not all the time. It seems to burp from somewhere, probably underground, coming up through a fissure. This is an extremely intriguing measurement <coughs> that needs to be followed up in the near future. But the most amazing thing that was just published just a few months ago is the following. What, as I said, the rover had found in the past was very simple organic materials. You know, organic materials, things with carbon in them, are the building blocks of all life as we know it. That organic material, that material with carbon plus water and energy, equals a living system. So these simple molecules <coughs> that we see here are interesting, and I'll show you what they're called in a second, but they don't tell you whether or not there might have been living material there. So I'm going to start a little animation. It'll go by fairly quickly, and you'll see the difference between what we knew a few years ago and what we know today. So this material on the, the right is propane, which you barbecue with, and now this is what they've found. Just published a few months ago, something called kerogen. What do we know about kerogen? On Earth, kerogen is what's left over from algae and woody plants, trees, trees and algae that fall and are preserved and go through some uh, degradation process, that's what turns into kerogen. So maybe, just maybe in the past, we had some simple organisms, maybe even some trees and plants growing on Mars. Again, the kind of extraordinary result that we've been waiting for for years, and that's why this mission was built, was to look for this kind of result. So where are we today <coughs> with respect to the science? I would say for ancient life, the potential has increased dramatically. We really now have the water, water ice, 
looks like a liquid water lake. We have organic material. We have energy. So ancient life, I think, is a, becoming a greater possibility. And what we need to do now is to bring some samples back. Modern life, maybe. The methane is intriguing. That needs to be followed up on. Um, as a minimum, though, what we see is that Mars is far more diverse than anybody ever thought when we started this program about 20 years ago. So I think the next step is from follow the water to seeking the signs of life and ultimately affordable human exploration. And I'll come to that in the next section. Before we do, though, the next science mission, I was talking to some of you about what's next. What's next is to go to the surface, collect some samples, very carefully selected samples, bring those to orbit, and bring them back to Earth. Because on Earth, we can take a sample, we can examine it in hundreds of laboratories with thousands of scientists. They can cross-check each other's results. It really is a, a very, very powerful tool and would represent a big step in our knowledge about Mars. So the um, next step has been approved. It's under construction. Uh, if you went to uh, JPL and Pasadena, California, you could see there on the floor in the clean room how they're putting this, this rover together. So this is a really, really uh, amazing next step, and it will launch in just a little over a year from now to Mars. <clears throat> That's all science. And whenever I give a talk like this, people invariably say, yes, fascinating. Did life ever uh, emerge on Mars? Want to know that? But when are people going to go? So this next section, I'm going to give you my thoughts. These are not endorsed by NASA or anybody else, uh, but it's my thoughts on sending people to Mars. So for decades, when I was on a radio show or being interviewed by Bryant Gumbel or Katie Couric or somebody, they would uh, say, well, when are we going to send people to Mars? And I'd say, well, there's about five big showstoppers that we've got to deal with. 